receive the Lord in prayer. Praise His God in heaven. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify your name. We come to your throne of grace with our full of gratitude and thanksgiving. Any sense that we are committed, please do forgive us. Accept us as we are, as we ponder upon your word. May your presence lead us, giving us an opportunity to be a part of you. May your presence go with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The mission spotlight today is quite a very interesting one. We all are on the lockdown. Same thing happened with a pastor called Sendal Kumalov. On his knees in uh, South Africa's biggest city, Johannesburg, when there was a national lockdown, they followed some stringent methods that nobody should go out, everything is locked up, not selling anything, tough regulation, closed parks, and banned jogging, dog walking, even the sale of cigarettes and alcohols were banned. Like many pastors, Sendile also moved his ministry online. Live stream went on. He had three churches. One is Johannesburg uh, Central Church. Another one is so Johannesburg CBD Church and Johannesburg Intercity Church. All these three churches were been taken care of by Pastor Sendal Kumalo. Sometimes he received some encouraging messages from people inspired by his preaching. But he longed to do more even though it was limited. But he earnestly prayed that God send me a non-believer that they could accept Jesus to be a personal savior. One day, Sandai, he received a WhatsApp message from a very unfamiliar number. The sender introduced himself to be as a Hilton and he sent a photo of a Bible. He sent a photo of the Bible that he had found in a Minivian taxi. Minivian taxi is nothing but there are more than three to four or five to six people joining and traveling. So that is called as Minivian taxi. So he, was, he got that Bible as he was traveling in a Minivian taxi which will carry multiple passengers. So he picked up the Bible in the taxi, the Hilton writes. And then he saw Sandile's name, Pastor Sandile's name on the Bible, on the Bible. The Bible was red in color, or you can call it as a burgundy color. And then his phone number was there. So that's one of the reasons he saw the address, he saw the phone number and Hilton messaged him saying that I got this Bible, this might be yours. So Pastor Sender looked into the photo with very much interest. He owned several Bibles but he never remembers this particular Bible. And he never remembers that he recently been able to travel in a minivan van. He goes to his lovely family members and asks them, did we ever travel in a minivan van? Did we own a Bible of this sort any time? And pastor re tried to recollect. He might have been forgotten. He tries to recollect where did he get this Bible? But it's of no avail because he couldn't remember getting a Bible of this color and writing his name and his phone number on the Bible. It was very much surprise. Hilton was not bothered that Sandal did not recognize the Bible, but uh, he was more interested in finding out what is in the truth in the Bible that he had got. Because 
Jaitan never read Bible any time. So he was eager to start. He asked Sendai whether he would be willing to help him to read it. And he wanted some Bible studies. Of course, Sendai knew at the moment that God had heard his prayer that he was always kneeling down and praying to send an unbeliever towards him to accept Jesus to be a personal savior. He thought that this is the messenger of God. Even though Pastor Sendai never recognized from where this Bible came from and how his address and his phone number was written. And uh, one thing is for sure, the mystery Bible gave an opportunity to minister for an unbeliever. And I hope that inter interaction will lead uh, to Hilton accepting Jesus Christ as his personal savior. God works in a mysterious way. You and I can never fathom the way how he wants to. But when you lean down and seek the Lord and say, Lord, show me what am I supposed to do today? Where am I supposed to go? And I know the Lord will not disappoint you. He will never, ever disappoint you at any cost. And he is going to grant the mercies that you and I might be able to be used by him and him alone. One important, beautiful, thought-provoking yeah. mission spotlight that we were able to get into. May God bless Pastor Sendai. We are in lesson three, and uh, our Sabbath school lesson is entitled as the Roots of Restlessness. This meeting is being recorded. The Roots of Restlessness. When we really talk about the roots of restlessness, we do have a small illustration being given now in the Sabbath school lesson. If we have gone through, you and I will be able to find out a very interesting aspect, a very, very interesting aspect in this lesson today. Uh, there is a tree called as aspens. These are very beautiful trees, very beautiful trees. I don't know whether you've seen that, uh, but I have an opportunity to get to know about this trees. It reaches nearly, nearly 45 to 90 feet, or you can talk 15 to 30 inches or 30 meters in height. They usually thrive in a very cold climate. They thrive in a very, very cold climate. Uh, with cool summer, their wood is basically used uh, to make furniture and also for making matches and paper. That's what they say. And uh, their wood is always used in the furnitures. You know, uh, during this uh, uh, cold season, especially when we have a lot of snowfall and things like that, some of the animals like uh, deer and uh, some of those little, little animals, they feed on the barks of this aspens. This bark contains quite a very much of nutrients and this tree called aspens needs a lot of sunshine and they all grow all the time in many places especially in winter making them so important it is the food it is the source of food for many animals you know, aspens, however, are most uh, notorious for the fact that they have one of the largest root system in the plant world. One of the largest root system in the plant world. Aspens have it. The root spreads uh, by underground suckers uh, and form a colony that can spread relatively very quick covering large areas of land. That is the beauty of this aspens. Their roots are so strong and so much enlarged that it occupies a lot of space underground. Individual aspen trees can live up to nearly 150 long years. How many long years? 150 long years. 
the roots are so deep and so vast among all the plant system the root system of aspens is large yes it can live for 150 long years but the larger organisms below the ground can live for thousands of years the root system and the organism which has been spread the roots and they can live for thousand long years yes my dear brothers and sisters in Christ we are going to discover some of the roots of our restlessness there are many things that can prevent us from uh, finding the true rest in Jesus some of these are obvious and don't require much attention others may require a lot of attention so that we can really find rest in this restless world and that is the topic that we have the roots of restlessness the memory text is taken from james chapter 3 verse 16. the bible says it very clearly for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist there will be disorder and every while practice listen to this statement once again it simply says that for where jealousy and selfish ambitions exist there will be disorder and every while practice yes my dear brothers and sisters in Christ wherever you might be watching today online the roots of restlessness as our roots of restlessness spread like this aspen tree occupying the large ground in a heart the organisms which develop in the root system of aspens can live for thousands of years ago and do you think you and i have the same restlessness which spread like the aspen roots Occupy larger grounds of a heart, mind, and soul, which can never be eliminated. And that's what we're going to address today in our lesson. A very interesting statement in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 39. The Sunday's lesson is talking about Jesus brings division. You know, very few people, very, very few people enjoy conflict. Nobody likes to have a conflict. In fact, for myself, I try to run away from conflict. But it is inevitable we have to face conflicts. But I, I, I don't like to argue. I don't like to bring uh, dissension. I don't like to uh, make sure if there is a conflict that I want to aggregate. No, better be silent and just move away. Even though if you are not wrong, accept that you are wrong. You know, that's the way most probably I, 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 I don't I, I personally I don't like conflicts at all so very few people enjoy conflict we crave for harmony and peace the whole world is in a restless place now I will take from East and West and North and South India China Pakistan Afghanistan go back to again the European Union come back to the Western country like America Canada Come back into Switzerland, any part of the land today, what we go through the news is restlessness, conflict. There is no harmony and peace. Everybody are fighting for their own selves. And that's one of the reasons we do have seminars to teach peacemakers and conflict resolution in our churches and our institution. Don't you think so? There is no rest, rest that there is a, a restlessness in our churches, in our institution individual family we battle this in a day-to-day -day activity but interestingly in Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 to 39 where Jesus is talking about a very very shocking counter intuitive method a very counter intuitive method the Savior who came to this earth as a helpless babe instead of a powerful king Jesus never came as a powerful king he came as a babe he never had around an allied bodyguards around him when he arrived on this earth but a helpless babe who preached love to both 
neighbors and enemies. Now it tells his followers that he brings uh, division and struggles. Wow, that is astounding. Jesus said, I've come here on this earth to bring what? Division. I have bring, I'm going to bring you struggles. His disciples and his audience, when they heard this statement from Jesus, uh, may have wondered, as we are wondering, how can this be? How can we be divided? How can this be? When Jesus himself is making his beautiful his statement uh, very much clear, to the point, I want to bring division. If you go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 35 and 39, is really about allegiance and loyalty. He was quoting Micah chapter 7, verse 6. Jesus was challenging his audience to make choices for eternity. And that's what is very much important. A son should love and honor his parents, right? Yeah, that was a law of God. Honor thy father and thy mother. That was very much legal. That was a legal requirement for the law that Moses had received on the mountain, right? We all know that, right? It was part of God's required mode of operation. And yet, if that love would trump the hearer's commitment to Jesus, it required a very tough decision. A father and a mother should love and care for their children, right? Yet, if that love would top the parents' commitment to Jesus, it required a very different decision altogether. First things first, Jesus reminds us in this passage of Matthew chapter 10, verse 35 to 39. Here, Jesus expresses this choice by formulating three sentences, each using the term worthy. He says that worthiness is not based on high moral standards or even overcoming sin. Understand this one. Understand this one. A very, very, very important. Worthiness is not based on high moral standards or even overcoming sin. You can I never say, oh, I, I, I am a very good standing member because I am morally right. No. Worthiness is based on one's relationship with Jesus. Worthiness is really talking about the relationship with Jesus. We are worthy when we choose him about everything else. About everything else if you and I could be able to take allegiance towards him. Be loyal towards him. Whatever it may come, however things might be, we prioritize Jesus in every angle. And that is called as worthiness. How well you keep the law, how alive you become uh, when you obey the law doesn't make sense. It simply makes sense uh, that if you and I prioritize Jesus than anything, anyone else. And that is worthiness. We choose him above everything else, including mother, including father, or children. We choose the suffering of the cross and follow Jesus. And that is worthiness. You know, I have no higher wish than to see our youths, our children, our church members, if you would with the spirit of a pure religion which will lead them to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Go forth, young disciples of Christ, controlled by principles clad in the robe of purity and righteousness. Your Savior will guide you into the position best suited to your talents and where you can be used in every angle of life. And that's what worthiness counts a lot keep jesus about everything else respecting jesus about everything else 
prioritizing Jesus than anything and everything that you possess on this earth, including yourself. And that's the reason Jesus says very clearly, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, pick up the cross and follow me. That is the strife. That is the division. That is the way how the Lord has been able to put forth and let know each one of us in this regard. Sometimes we are much forced to bear the cross. We are forced to bear, right? Like parents always tell us, you have to do this, you should not go here, you should do only this. We are forced sometimes. And sometimes we voluntarily bear the cross, just like Simeon, when Jesus was bearing his cross, and suddenly Jesus was unable to lift up, so called this guy called Simeon, he accidentally got caught and he started bearing the cross. Either way, what is the key to bearing the cross faithfully? Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever we might be listening to God's word today, Jesus brings division. It simply says that do we prioritize Jesus first? Do we prioritize Jesus? Are we be able to give prominence to him and willing to deny ourselves, pick up the cross and follow him? More than our parents, more than our children, more than our job, more than our wealth, more than anything else that we possess on this earth. So, worthiness calls for obedience, implicit obedience. The obedience where you and I will be able to give to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's what it means to say. That's what it means to say. So Jesus brings division. So that is the Sunday's part of the lesson. Let's go a little bit further to Monday's lesson. Very important lesson for you and me. Very, very, very important lessons for you and me. It is talking about selfishness don't forget we are in lesson three we are talking about the roots of restlessness right so one of the roots that we are talking about is uh, division which happens uh, okay because we give allegiance to a lot and Savior Jesus Christ most probably we might have restlessness because of selfishness that makes sense Listen to this one, as in the case of the Aspen and its larger underground root system, selfishness is part of the huge underground system called as sin. Why selfishness? Sin existed, which keeps us from finding true rest in Jesusness. If you and I are not being able to find that real true rest in Jesus Christ, uh, which means there might be another underlying factor of our life that is selfishness, which has been grounded in each one of our lives. Who is not selfish? Let me know. Who is not selfish? People are watching online. You have any questions? You want to clarify? You want to contribute? You can be able to please to communicate with us. No problem. Selfishness. Who is not selfish? Everybody, right? You tell me one person who is not selfish. The child who is born on this earth, the very time the child starts growing, becomes so selfish. And the same child who grows up, grows up, looks into the selfish world and becomes selfish. The circumstances and the surrounding areas teaches the child to be selfish. Later on, when this child grows to be an adult, Yes, becoming old, you become more selfish. Everything I wanted. Why? The root cause of the problem is sin. Which keeps us from finding the real true rest in Jesus Christ. Of all the expressions of sin in our lives, selfishness seems to be the easiest to manifest. Aha! Doesn't it? For most of us, Selfishness is a natural, very much natural. It is so natural, it is just easy as we breathe every day. <laughs> right? You can't eliminate it. It is just like the breath in your nostrils. 
That's one of the reasons we have in the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. We have a problem being highlighted in Jesus' parable. And uh, is planning for the future selfishness and expressing deep disregard for God's kingdom. If not, or at least not necessarily. If you have to look into the parable in Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21, you will be able to find out a very important aspect that you and I can be able to learn. This parable appears only in the Gospel of Luke and it is told in response to an anonymous question from the audience asked about a question regarding an inheritance and in this parable you see Jesus respond so crisply what is that he opts to put his finger on the bigger underlying problem namely selfishness he digs deeper into show the root mass underneath our individual action let's read from the bible itself the book of luke chapter 12. you and i know the story there's nothing new but i want to read and highlight a very important aspect of it it is talking about uh, luke chapter 12 verse 13. it says and one of the company jesus unto him a master speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me and he said unto him man who made me a judge or a divider over you and he said unto them take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth the whole world sees you a better man when he sees position in you. And that's the way how the world regards you as the best person when they see position in you. But Jesus counter reacts to this and say, no, that is not the way. And he goes on to say this one. And he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain man brought forth plentiful. And he sought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Verse 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Wow. But God said unto him, Thou fool. Underline that word. The whole world looks at you when you have positions and property and we have everything. They regard you as one of the greatest man. Respect comes so spontaneously, right? Your Jesus is counter reacting towards it. And he says, Listen to me, O fool, you who have abundance. Listen to me, O fool, you are so selfish. Listen to me, O fool, he says it. This night, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Wow! Many a times, the Bible says it very clearly, it is better, better to become fool, fools for Christ's sake than to be fools on the world's sake. What I mean to say, Jesus comes and tells you, and says, thy soul is been required of thee today. You have built upon, everything is full, I'm going to take your life. What do you think so? You have collected everything and kept. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus responds by rejecting of the arbiter between brothers. Instead, he opts to put the finger on a bigger underlying problem, namely selfishness. It digs deeper to show 
the root mass underneath our individual actions. I want to ask about this uh, question. Think about the expressions of selfishness in your life. How does selfishness affect our relationship with God? With our spouses and our families, with our church families, with our neighbors and with our colleagues at work. You know, by focusing solely on his own needs and ambitions, the anonymous rich man of Jesus' parable forgot to take into consideration unseen heavenly realities. It was bigger, it was better, and more are not the foundational principles of God's kingdom. Paul offers us a glimpse into what motivated Jesus as he decided to become a substitute. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 and 8 describes uh, the blueprint of unselfishness, humility and love. If love for God and others does not drive our choices and priorities, we will continue to build more bonds for ourselves here and put less treasures in heaven. If you and I have not been able to love God, and love neighbors, we will start building bonds on this earth and less treasure in heaven. No wonder Jesus said it very clearly. Do not put your treasures on the earth which you have seen. Put your treasures where? In an unseen thing. That is in heaven. Every individual will be upon selfish. I always uh, like to make this statement. Every individual is selfish in one way or the other. The Bible says it very clearly, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm telling you very honestly, as a pastor with the 21 years of my experience being with people, seldom I have saw people loving one another as their selves. Very hard. I'm so called as Christians, so called as even pastors, we don't love our neighbor like our own self. No, no, no. I've never seen anybody. We only talk. We only speak. We only make sure that, you know, just to, for the audible the audience, okay, the, 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 the truth is uh, we have to love one another. That has just become mere words. I want to ask you this question, anyone who's been able to watch online, have you loved your neighbor as yourself? The way how you treat your own spouses and your children, will you be able to treat the same way your neighbor? A thought to be thought about is more practical. Can you provide what you provide for your own family for a neighbor? Can you be able to love the same way how you love your family your own children. Can you and I be able to love our neighbors? I've hardly seen anyone, even a single person on this earth. Why? The roots of restlessness, one of the roots of restlessness is selfishness. Everything I wanted, I want to live. I want to enjoy. I want to exemplify. I can give a dollar to somebody. I can give 10 rupees to somebody. But I can't give 100 rupees to everybody. It calls for a commitment. It calls for a commitment. Can you and I be able to reflect on this one? Search into our hearts what Jesus was talking about. If you and I might be restless in one way or the other, one of the root causes might be selfishness. Any questions? Any contribution? Any comments? Most welcome. Let's get into the Tuesday's lesson. It is talking about ambition. <laughs> uh, we talked about um, uh, last week. We had a very good panel discussion, right? And uh, we talked about uh, uh, the ministry uh, of Jesus Christ prior to uh, his last days before getting into the cross of Calvary. Uh, 
you see the Lord's Supper happening. And we have the disciples sitting. And uh, Jesus uh, was also being a part of the Last Supper. You and I know that very much which is recorded in Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 30. And you see a very important aspect of it. We seldom discuss with others who is the greatest in our church, right? Nobody discuss that one. Okay, in the church, nobody discusses who is the greatest among everybody. Please let me know. We don't discuss. We don't get discuss who is the greatest. Uh, who is the greatest uh, in a family? When husband, wife, and children are there, we don't discuss, right? Who is the greatest? Father will not say, uh, "Am I the greatest?" Mother will not say, "Am I the greatest?" Children will not say, "Am I the greatest?" No, no, we will not. Okay, and then what happens? Uh, okay, but. We may think about it a lot, right? But who really openly talks about it? Nobody openly talks about it, right, Sister Mary? Nobody talks about who is the greatest, either in a church, in a family, or a workplace. But everybody, what? Thinks about it. No option. That has been part of it. Okay? This was not the first time that this question was raised in a community of Jesus followers in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. You see, don't ever forget the background here. Jesus is about to go to be crucified. The last supper, the last meal was supposed to have. Jesus is sitting in the front. And we have the disciples sitting there. And then the disciples asking, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? In Matthew chapter 18 verse 1. Okay, this question to Jesus and framing it more in an abstract way, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus answers, involves an object lesson. After calling the child, he sets the child in the center of the groups, eyes are open wide, eyebrows are raised. Jesus' action requires an explanation in Matthew chapter 8, verse 3. And we know the master offers that too. Uh, certainly I say unto you, unless you are converted, and become as a what? A little child. You will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. No means you will be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. No means you will be able to what? Enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see, conversion is foundational for Finding true rest in Jesus, we recognize that we need an outside help. We suddenly realize that we cannot depend on ourselves but need to rely on Jesus. We experience a transformation of our values and ambitions. Ambition. Very important. Jesus said, trust me. And rely on me as this little child does. True greatness is giving up your rights and embracing kingdom values. One of the root cause of restlessness is selfishness. The second one is ambitiousness. No wonder Jesus came down to this earth even though he was the king of kings and the lord of lords. He came down to this earth as a person who never had anything. And that's the reason he said, you see the birds of the air, it has nets. It has nests. You have foxes, they have holes. But the Son of Man, who is the creator of this world, doesn't have a place to lay down. He said, later on he was buried in a tomb which was not his. The whole world was his. But still, when he came down, he demonstrated that love. He demonstrated in his own life that nothing of this earth is mine. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, unfortunately, the disciples of Christ, even though they walked with him, they ate with him, they mingled with him. They never understood Jesus while he was there on this earth. Because all were ambitious. What is what might be another root for restlessness? Ambition. Number one is 
selfishness. Number two is ambitiousness. Yes. We had a very sad example how corrupt the human art remains when we look into the disciples sitting at the table and arguing who should be the greatness. Yeah. But one of the most positive sides, however, thinks about that, that ever-present reality of a Lord's grace, you see, that despite this pathetic discussion among his followers, Jesus didn't give up, give up on the disciples. Even though they were fighting among themselves, but still, by his grace, Jesus never gave up on his disciples. It's just the same way. You and I might be able to give up on Jesus, but Jesus will never give up, give up on me. You might be selfish, you might be ambitious, but still when you run to Jesus Christ, He is still not willing to give up on you. He is willing to embrace you in every angle. Uh, so, one of the other cause of restlessness might be ambition. Any questions? Anything that we can be able to contribute? More happy. Go to the witnesses part where we know that the third part is hypocrisy. Wow. Are we hypocrites? If I want to ask you a question. Introspect ourselves. Mm -hmm. What is hypocrisy? A hypocrite is somebody who play acts, who wants to appear to be somebody which he or she is not. That's what hypocrisy is all about. I always say this one, Sister Mary. We are not the way how we are. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about myself. You know, I'm talking about as a pastor. I'm talking about as a child of God. Many times when we portray others to others, our lives, we portray to others stating that I'm just, I'm good, I'm right, but which I'm not internally. That's what hypocrisy means. That's an example. Okay? You know, the term used, hypocrisy is used nearly seven times in Matthew chapter 23. I want to urge each one of you to please go read Matthew chapter 23 every time. Every time. Please read Matthew chapter 23. You'll be able to understand. We have two allied groups here. One is the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pharisees are no one else but they are very conservative religious sect. Very conservative religious sect in the first century AD. Okay, they represented the conservative religious right wing. They were interested in the 10 of the oral law and emphasized ritual purity. That was Pharisees. On the other side of the spectrum were Sadducees, a group of mostly wealthy leaders. Wealthy leaders often associated with the elite priestly class. And they were Hellenistic. Hellenistic means they spoke Greek and were at home in Greek philosophy. They were very much nervous. So that is, that is the meaning of Hellenistic. Okay. And did not believe in a judgment or after death, what will happen? They are going to live. No, they never believed that. We would describe them as liberals. One is conservative, Pharisees. Another one is liberals. Both are so extreme. The Pharisees are so extreme. You have to keep the law in order to just get things done. But when it comes to the Sadducees, they are more liberal. Eh, no problem. We are not worrying about what is going to happen after death. So why worry about anything? So they become so liberal here. So conservative and liberals. And in Matthew chapter 23, you will be able to see how Jesus addresses the issues of Pharisees and Sadducees. According to Jesus, we are hypocrites. We are hypocrites. If we don't do what we say, when we make religion harder for others without applying the same standards to ourselves, what happens? 
when we want others to applaud our religious fervor, and when we require honor and recognition that belongs only to our heavenly father. No matter how sharp and to the point is worse, Jesus' engagement with those he called hypocrites were nevertheless full of love and concern even for those hypocrites. You know, Jesus, when he addresses the issue for Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, he never said, wow, you're hypocrites, you're not the way how you are, so I'm going to disown you in every angle. No, he has a soft corner to that. And you know what he says? He simply says, uh, listen to what all they say. God is giving, Jesus is giving an opportunity for them to reconcile once again. For both this class, Pharisees and Sadducees, his grace is sufficient. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and then upon the hearers. You, you remember? You, you remember when Jesus was, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the next day, he's supposed to be crucified. The previous day, uh, everybody called him Hosanna, Hosanna, the King of Kings. Uh, and what happens? He looks back into Jerusalem and he pities Jerusalem and he says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, thou killest the prophets. And what does the Bible say? Just like the hen protects his loved chickens. And he says, What? Have I not done to protect you in every act? We see the Pharisees and Sadducees were hypocrites. We are not the way how we are. We say, but we don't do. Externally, we are one type. Internally, we are another type. But still, God in his own infinite mercy has called you and me to be a part of him. You know, Jesus always... Uh, Loved each one of us. Yeah. You know one thing? God in his own infinite mercy loved each one of us. Whoever we are. Jesus came down to this earth to seek and save the lost. He didn't want anyone to just sigh away from him. He wanted to give an opportunity for you and me to be a part of him. But one of the root causes for restlessness on this earth might be what? Hypocrisy. Number one is selfishness. Number two is ambitiousness. Number three might be hypocrisy. But in spite of that, God is called human being. And even now, being willing to make amends with each one of us so that we can change our heart, mind and soul. To be a part of him in every act. Any questions? Beautiful lesson, right? More practical. More practical. Let's get into the Thursday's lesson. It is talking about uh, uprooting restlessness. Uprooting restlessness. Let's turn the Bible to the book of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14, verse 1 to 6. The Bible says it very clearly. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, that ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know. And the way ye know it very well. That's what it means to say. In the midst of our own restlessness, what can we do so that our hearts will not be feel troubled? What's the key to overcome division, selfishness, ambition, and hypocrisy and find the real true rest? That's where John chapter 14 verse 1 to 6 coming to existence. Oh, come he that heavy laden. Uh, then I will what? Give you rest. The real rest, the real peace, the real happiness, 
lies not in jealousy, not in selfishness, not in ambition, not in hypocrisy, but that has to be uprooted in every angle. I told you the story of Aspen's right? Its root is been enlarged on the ground. So there's nothing that we can be able to uproot, but Jesus says, come unto me. He says, I'm going to uproot that. Overcoming restlessness always begins with Jesus. Overcoming restlessness always begins with Jesus because the Bible says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He knows the right direction. Whether we know, I don't know. The only way is that he knows the right direction when we wander aimlessly in the wilderness of your, of our, uh, you know, media saturated world. As the divine lawgiver himself is a personified truth and his spirit will guide us unto all truths. That's what it means to say in John chapter 16 verse 13. The spirit will lead us to all truth. That's what he says. When we are hurt, when we are tired, when we are worn out, when we are sick and discouraged, the Bible says it very clearly that he is our life. He is our life giver. Not just any life. He says that in fact he has promised us life in abundance. That's what we read in John chapter 10 verse 10. What? Does that life in abundance mean for you and me? This includes our eternal home and eternal life. But it also entrains a different quality of life here on this earth. Don't ever forget. We are not looking into eternity when Jesus comes the second time. The quality of life when we're going to live with Jesus forever. He is talking about the quality of life that we will be able to enjoy here on this earth. That is the beauty. The question goes around for each one of us today. Are we be able to enjoy the same eternity or the kingdom of a Lord on this earth here with me, with my family, with my church members, with my neighbors? If we have to, selfishness, ambition, hypocrisy has to be uprooted. And Jesus says, come unto me. And is calling each one of us to be a part of him so that you and I will enjoy that eternity here on this earth. That's what he means to say. And that's the reason the Bible says it very clearly, let not your heart be what troubled. What does it mean? It simply means that it's an invitation to live in anticipation when you feel low. Is able to put us on a higher plane. When we struggle with darkness and sin, he is the one who not only began, but also will finish a good work which he has been started. Which is recorded in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. The Bible says it very clearly. He who has begun a good work is not only begun, and he says that he is for what? Completed. Provided. If you and I will be able to put our trust in matter for him. No matter how bad things get here. And yes, they can get very bad. Look at the promises that we have been given in Jesus Christ. He is preparing a place for you and me. A place where our pain, restlessness and suffering will ever be banished. That is the hope we have been given in Jesus Christ and is offered to all of us no matter who you are, no matter how our background and no matter how solid our lives have been or how our lives are now, no matter where you are, whatever you are. The key, however, is for us to come to God anyway in our weakness. He is anticipating for you and me to come to Him in our weakness, in our weakness, in our hurt, in our brokenness, in our general fallen state, knowing that he accepts us despite all these things that we possess. That is what grace is all about. 
Don't change yourself and come to Christ. No. If you can come change yourself and come to Christ, you don't need Christ at all. What God is telling is in your brokenness, in your hurtfulness, in your hypocrisy, in your selfishness, in your ambition, way of life, come to me. I will change. That's what we look in. The Spirit will guide you into all truths. Come in and every day and I will give you rest. I've gone and prepared a place for you. Eternity. You don't need to change. You can never change. You and I can never change. That's what I told you. Can you love your neighbor as yourself? Ask this question very intently. No, we can't as human beings. We can never love our neighbors as ourselves. The way how oh, I love my child. Can I be able to love somebody else's child? Can I be able to provide everything what I provide for my child for somebody else? No. We give him $10 and say, sorry sir, this is the maximum that I have. I love you. I pray for you. May God take care. That's the reality of life, Sister Mary. That's what Jesus is talking about. But we come to Jesus as we are. He is the one who's going to change. He gave it all. And he expects us to give it all. We have to uproot the restlessness. The restlessness is because of all the roots of jealousy, selfish ambition that exists in our life. God is telling, come unto me. I'm going to uproot all those stuff. Yes, we come as we are. And that's the reason we need grace. You can never earn God's merit, God's love. It's only by His grace He has given us an opportunity. He accepts us despite these things. One day we must believe that we have been given if we seek for it in faith and faith alone. I'd like to read the last part of this story here in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 22. Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 22. The Bible says it very clearly for you and me. Return ye backsliding children and I will heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee for thou art the Lord our God. What is the Bible calling for you and me? What is he telling? Come to me, backsliding children. What will I do? I will accept you as you are. I'll change you in every angle. That's what God is asking. Think about Jesus' words. I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. We find that in John chapter 14, verse 3. Think about the words of Jesus. What should this tell us about how central and crucial the promise of the second coming is all about, right? Especially for us as an Adventist with our outstanding, with our understanding of what death is all about. Why is the promise of the second coming so precious for you and me? Very important questions to be asked. So, our answer, our, 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 our restlessness has to be uprooted. If that has to be uprooted, we have to accept Jesus to be a person and say, we are come to him as we are. And you will see a change happening in your life and my life. There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. No way. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as a personal savior, you ought to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ, tell of his goodness, do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon the heart and by every means in your power, seek to save the lost. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The grace of the spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase, your convictions deepen, your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. And that's what Ellen White states in Christ's object, lesson page 67 and 68. If you and I be able to make Jesus as 
a part of us and a personal savior, what happens? The fruits of the Spirit grows and people can see that fruit of the Spirit in each one of our lives and you and I could be able to be reflectors of His love and His character and we can make a little heaven on this earth experiencing Jesus here with our family, with our church, with our institution, with our workplace and with the neighbors and everyone who comes to us, your life and my life. May God bless each one as we contemplate. Uh, do we have any other questions? or not have any contribution? Anything that you want to add up to? We'll be very happy to be able to go about it. If not, uh, we'll wind up in uh, Repeating this text in uh, James chapter 3 verse 16. Uh, okay. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every while practice. May God bless each one of us. God give us power and energy so that Christ Jesus can approve all our restlessness. Give us the perfect rest in which lies in Jesus and Jesus alone. That's my prayer for you this evening, this morning. Sorry. Okay, offering will be collected before we be able to uh, close. Uh, so before we close, let's all seek the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you, we glorify your name. Thank you for the beautiful words of life. Give us an opportunity to experience your love. Accept your grace freely. We want Jesus to work in our hearts. Have mercy on us. And give us an opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good, is sweeter than honey. May your name be magnified and glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining the a Sabbath school lesson and uh, we'll just take a break and we'll be back again for the Divine Art.